Good evening and welcome to the final uh, Naturalist Night um, presentation in our series this winter. Um, tonight's presentation is Dr. Jason Seibold, and he's going to talk about some of the work he's been doing up in the Hunter Creek Valley, and it's a fire history of the area, which is um, um, really good information to have when you start contemplating making decisions about forest management and forest health. It's good to know what's, what's happened before, so we we go into it eyes wide open. So we're really pleased to have Dr. Jason Seibold here tonight. Um, I want to uh, um, emphasize that the Naturalist Nights is a collaboration between the Aspen Wilderness Workshop, Aspen Wilderness Workshop, ha, huh. that's where we used to be. Now we're just a wilderness workshop. <laughs> Aspen Center for Environmental Studies and the Roaring Fork Audubon. Uh, so we're really pleased to collaborate with these guys um, on this series through the winter. Tonight's featured sponsors are Ken Ransford, uh, PC. Uh, he's a, a tax lawyer and an accountant and Grassroots uh, Community t net TV Network. So thanks, Grassroots. And by the way, Grassroots is filming this now so that we can uh, broadcast it later via our websites. And these are all our sponsors. And these are the guys that, um, that give us money that help us pay for Grassroots to do the tech work they do to make um, the videos available for folks um, to see the, see the show if they missed it or to watch it from afar. So thanks all our sponsors and please, please patronize our sponsors so that you know, they know that they're loved. <coughs> so uh, Dr. Jason Seibold, I'm going to introduce him. Uh, Jason has three degrees, a BA, an MA, and a PhD all from the University of Colorado in Boulder. He was a Fulbright Fellow working in southern Chile. So, now he's now associate professor at CSU. Uh, and he worked as an hourly tourist kiosk in Durango, uh, just to buff out his CV a little bit. It's <laughs> <laughs> my first job after I finished my PhD. <laughs> but perhaps his most plum assignment was working for the Aspen Skiing Company as a ski instructor. So this is kind of a homecoming for Jason. We're pleased to have that. Pleased to have him here. He's also taught skiing in New Zealand, uh, and he is, uh, um, I'll, I'll let him talk about the focus of his work, but some of the interesting things, he's got a young family, he's living in Fort Collins, he's raising them according to the Bible of Outside Magazine, uh, drinking the beer they tell him to drink, wearing the shoes they tell him to wear, going to places they tell him to go. Um, so without much more of that, thank you, Jason, for coming tonight, and we're really pleased to have you. All right, thanks. going to switch over here. Thanks for the, uh, for the intro, Sloan. I appreciate it. Yeah, bit of a homecoming. Um, I, uh, I, I lived in Glenwood while I taught for a little while in, in Aspen and uh, would ride the bus. And, you know, uh, I'm sure I never, I never imagined that I would be giving a talk that anybody would actually come to listen to, you know. So a um, bit of a homecoming. It's really nice. It's great to be here. I like this area. I like working here. Um, this is the, the only, one of the only places where um, I haven't been pursued to work. So the National Park Service, I work in Grand Teton and Glacier and Rocky Mountain National Park um, and Great Sand Dunes National Park. And they all call me and say, hey, can you come and do this project or that project? Um, and the National Forest Service does a lot of the same kind of thing. And um, this is the only place where I've been calling saying, hey, can I come do something there? Um, I like this area. It's, it's nice. It feels a little, little homey. Um, and uh, it's, it's great to work with people who care about their landscape. Um, ACES and Wilderness Workshop have been awesome to work with on a couple different projects. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice place to work for a number of reasons. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about this uh, fire history of Hunter Creek and Smuggler Mountain. Um, but I, you know, it's a small area. It's an important area. It's, a, it's an important area to Aspen. Um, it's an important kind of historical site. Um, obviously, it's an important recreational site at this point in time. Um, it's in the view shed of Aspen. It's right there. Um, but I know, so I, I understand the significance of that place and of that landscape, but at the same time, I wanna try and put this into some broader kind of um, perspective and context of disturbance ecology, climate change, um, and, and maybe prepare you guys for, 
for a few different ideas. And I'll also uh, really quickly say thanks for coming out. I know um, daylight savings time, it's changed now. It's light outside. If I was living here, I would probably be fly fishing instead of listening to my own talk. Um, so I appreciate you coming. I will, I will try to make it as exciting as I possibly can. Um, so the big broad overview of what I want to talk about, I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about disturbance ecology because that's what fire is. It's an ecological disturbance. It's a natural disturbance. Um, we'll get into a little bit more detail with fire ecology specifically, which is a disturbance, and then forest restoration in the context of fire ecology. The fire history research ideas, why we do it, how we do it, etc. Um, just enough kind of background on these things, like these methods, um, to, to convince you that I did something, that I know what I'm talking about, that there's actual evidence. I didn't just walk out there and um, get a sense of things and, and uh, go home. I, I took samples and I interpret them in a certain way, et cetera. Get into some of the results um, and then kind of give you this um, overall picture. You know, the goal for me here is to pre prepare you for fire. Um, the, the forest that we live in, they burn. They burn naturally. It's a big part of, of um, the system. It's an important part of their system, um, as well as beetles. We see the power of beetles to transform the landscape. Um, I know the mountain pine beetle outbreak is waning and is you know, kind of in the final throes here because they've eaten all of the um, largest diameter lodgepole pine in the state at this point in time. So they um, are, are uh, no longer a, a major presence. But uh, now we have spruce beetles and spruce beetles are on your doorstep. Um, and I think that you shouldn't just be prepared for fire. You should also be thinking about things like spruce beetles. There's also a Douglas fir beetle that's already in your landscape here in the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, and the big reason I want you to think about these things is they're inevitable, they're coming. Um, and if we just lay a little layer of climate change and a little bit of warming, all of these disturbances that we're talking about that affect our, our forests here in Colorado are very climate sensitive. So you go up one degree and okay, maybe the trout don't feel it, maybe the wildflowers don't feel it too much, et cetera, et cetera. But things like wildfires, they respond very quickly to a small increase in warming or a slightly um, increased sever severity of drought. Beetles, as we know, um, they love these warmer, drier conditions. It's not just the drier conditions that are driving our beetle outbreaks. It's actually um, kind of a new age style drought. It's not just dry, it's hot. And that, that's something that the beetles love um, and it stresses the trees out um, dramatically and lets the beetles take over. So a little bit about ecological disturbance. Um, up until the 1970s, there were, there were a lot of ideas about ecosystems being in balance and in check, and uh, that climate was this kind of primary driver of ecosystems, um, and that other things were kind of um, uh, not that important and or not natural to these ecosystems, or really important players in shaping ecosystem function and diversity, et cetera. And then in the 1970s, a lot of researchers started to say, hey, you know, we see that disturbance is really key for all of these different things that are going on from forests to tidal pools to mangroves to you name it, river systems, um, and that we need to maintain these things. We need to um, make sure that they're around. And a disturbance is loosely defined as any process that kills existing vegetation. Um, here are some shots, a, a landscape shot of, of the Wimanooch Wilderness in the San Juan Mountains, the Eastern Wimanooch Wilderness. Um, this is a spruce beetle outbreak. This is a close up of this. We basically have at this point in time, most of these valleys in the uh, spruce fir forests, um, we're approaching 100% mortality of the trees following this outbreak. This is a very different event than, uh, than the mountain pine beetle outbreak. Um, this is much, much higher severity than the mountain pine beetle outbreak. So this is an ecological disturbance. The beetles are native um, and they are killing vegetation. This is an example of a uh, blowdown in the Sangre de Cristos. You can see, uh, this was from, uh, shot from an airplane. You see some live trees here and some live trees here. And this entire patch of trees um, was blown down by a little microburst um, that came through. The Sangre is actually it blew down patches from about one to 20 um, acres in size, all the way from the, uh, from the New Mexico border to the Wyoming border, kind of scattered along um, the mountains. So that's another natural ecological disturbance that affects uh, forests here in Colorado. Avalanches, 
Um, and we have kind of two scenarios here. We have avalanches that are constantly running in these same tracks um, and basically keeping trees down at this level. So keeping trees short, um, keeping them fairly spread out, et cetera. And then we have avalanches that come in a big snow year, a big snow cycle, um, and they cut new pathways. And they, they play very different ecological roles, those two different types of avalanches. And fire. This is the Fern Lake fire that was uh, quite an extraordinary event in a uh, couple, couple years ago. Um, actually started up high at about 10, 10 and a half thousand feet elevation, burned up to tree line in December. This was a human started fire um, and uh, quite, a, quite an interesting scenario. So fires killing trees um, and changing the system and playing a really important role in these systems. So we see, you know, the focus is, hey, disturbance is killing trees. This, this isn't all so great, um, but it opens up opportunities for regeneration. So this is a fire in Glacier National Park. There is not a live tree for kilometers and kilometers here, but there are millions and millions of, of seedlings and saplings coming up from this fire in 2003. So it creates an opportunity for new um, individuals to regenerate, which turns out to be a really, really critical aspect of disturbance. That's the really big thing that they play. And here's an example from um, your, your drainage up higher towards Independence Pass about how disturbances influence the broader biodiversity on the landscape scale. So we look at individual patches and what happened to them, a blowdown or an avalanche or what have you. But then when we start to look at this broader landscape scale, we start to see that they play this really important role in, in maintaining um, biodiversity by creating a lot of different site types. Not only site types, but um, time since disturbance um, uh, and severity of disturbance, etc. So this is an air photo from um, right up the Roaring Fork Valley just below Independence Pass, and we see a patch of um, what is probably po young post-fire lodgepole pine here. You see how smooth that grain is. Um, I can look at those canopies and tell you that it's probably between 90 and 120 years old, something like that. Um, the canopy hasn't started to fall apart yet. Those trees are still pretty um, young and, and uh, vigorous. Um, we see that it, th and this was an area that was mined, so it could have been burned and, and cut and all sorts of things happened here. But um, nonetheless, given that it is lodgepole pine, um, there's probably some fire involved there because it's such a fire adapted species. Um, we see the edge of this fire or this cut or whatever it was um, stopped here. And we actually see some really old spruce fir in this strip here. Um, and it looks like it hasn't been affected by anything for quite some time. In contrast, we have a little smoother, finer grained spruce fir over in this area. That's probably a post-fire um, spruce fir forest. We have a younger um, post-fire site here. And then we see all of these avalanche pathways and, and rockfall pathways in here. Um, they're creating very different habitat types, critical for a lot of, um, uh, of the wildlife up there, in particular bears. Um, Avalanche pathways are amazing for berries if, if you ever walk through these things, um, and bears love them. If you uh, ever go hiking in Grand Teton National Park, don't linger long in the avalanche pathways. <laughs> um, we were there this past summer doing a lot of sampling on the edge of these pathways, trying to figure out how frequently they, they have these massive runs and maybe widen the pathway and whatever, and um, it was constant, um, okay, regroup, there's another bear kind of a situation. Um, so all this diversity of fire, rockfall, avalanches, wind blow down, spruce beetle outbreak, it's creating this amazingly um, heterogeneous landscape and biodiversity um, at this landscape scale. So it's really, really important. If we don't have any of these things, the, theoretically what would happen is um, it would start migrating towards this old, old spruce fir, um, kind of what would be referred to as in kind of the old uh, nomenclature as a climax forest. Um, and we wouldn't have all those other species. We wouldn't have all that critical habitat. So these disturbances are really, really critical. They also have these really strong ecological legacies. Uh, I don't know how this is looking a little washed out, but maybe you can see it. This is uh, Western Rocky Mountain National Park following the recent mountain pine beetle outbreak. And if you can see right in here, there's a bright green patch and it's surrounded by a sea of kind of gray dead standing trees. 
Um, so I did a bunch of fire history work here as a graduate student. And uh, this patch burned in 1901. All of the rest of this regenerated following a fire in 1654. So we have these long lasting ecological legacies where the trees weren't big enough in the 1901 patch to be hit by beetles because the beetles need a, a larger diameter tree, something about this size or larger to successfully attack and have their offspring come out. So they didn't bother with these smaller trees. They attacked all these larger trees in the older post-fire landscape. So we have these long lasting ecological legacies that are really, really important. They're also really important because we need to think about any treatments that we do today, any management actions that we take today are going to have these long lasting legacies for hundreds and hundreds of years. In particular in the landscape that surrounds most of uh, Carbondale and Up Valley here, subalpine landscapes, the return intervals, kind of the change over time in these landscapes is on the order of hundreds of years. It is not a five to 10 year kind of change. So if we cut, if we burn, whatever we do, it's going to have a long lasting legacy, hundreds of years. So we need to think things through um, very, very well. The, probably the most famous ecological um, legacy that you hear about is this idea that all of this forest here is much more likely to burn that it's been, uh, that it, that it's been hit by beetles. So that's another ecological legacy. It's the same idea that one disturbance intera interacts with future disturbances by influencing the, the potential for it to happen, the likelihood, the severity, the extent, the spread, etc. So if we're going to mimic them, we need to think about that. Disturbance is also really critical for um, species migration in the context of climate change. Here's a real simple schematic. Um, if we go to kind of the lowest elevations um, here in the Roaring Fork Valley or, or anywhere, most anywhere in Colorado, we'll have some grassland. Um, then we kind of transition up to slightly wetter sites that can support ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, kind of more spread out forest. Um, then we oftentimes transition at least kind of from here north into uh, lodgepole pine forests that need a little bit more moisture. And then even above that, um, up into uh, Engelmann spruce subalpine forests, which need a lot of moisture. These are, are really dominated by um, where there is consistent snowpack throughout the winter. So if we think about this in a warming world, these, these ponderosa and Douglas fir on the lower elevational edge of their distribution are going to start feeling some serious drought stress here if they aren't already. Um, same thing with the lower elevation zone of ponderosa pine and uh, Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir. So we can imagine that all of these limits are going to start moving up, hopefully. Hopefully this is how it, how it all works out. This is how it's worked out in the past, but um, we're running a really interesting experiment in that the, the rate of warming is going to be much, much faster than it was in the past. Um, so we're not sure exactly how quickly these things um, are going to move up. But you can imagine in this context, these things are, are trying to move up um, to this higher elevation zone, but it's like the bathroom on the airplane that's always occupied, right? If you've got other trees there where you're trying to go, it's hard to get established. It's, there's, there's already so much competition. You're shaded, the moisture's taken up by existing um, trees, uh, the nutrients in the soil are taken up by existing trees, etc. So it's occupied, these sites are occupied. So disturbance to the rescue. We can imagine some disturbance, a beetle, a fire, a wind blowdown, whatever, um, takes out some of these trees on the lower elevational um, edge of ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, and it allows grass, um, grasslands to expand up in elevation. So it gives it a very, um, uh, a much better opportunity to migrate upslope. The process of migrating upslope is challenging and complex enough that if you have, um, a lot of competition going on, it certainly doesn't facilitate that. And, and um, I'll, I'll just note that the, you know, a lot of the studies of species migration in the context of rapid climate change, they're following the end of the last glacial. It was very different. You didn't have trees expanding into areas that already had trees. You had trees expanding into 
pretty open areas, into areas that had been covered by um, snow and ice or grasslands. So trees were able to, to get into these places much easier um, than they can into places that are already occupied by trees. So we can imagine these things just stair step up. Um, I won't tell you the sad story of spruce and fir, but you get the idea. Um, they're getting squeezed, uh, and we, we have a very different kind of scenario for, uh, for their future. So a little bit more specific now on fire ecology and fire suppression and forest restoration. So we've been told this story a, a lot, but I'll go through it nonetheless just to set the stage. Um, and uh, make sure we're all on the same page. So we have this forest um, and then we add fire to it and fire comes through and it kills some trees, some seedlings, some saplings. Um, and these fires are fairly frequent. They're low severity. They do kill some trees, but they're low severity. Um, and they maintain this open kind of woodland scenario. Great, we've all been sold that or told that, right? So uh, enter smoky. Um, fire suppression practices, we stop these fires and what happens? Well, we convert this previously fairly open um, site type to this very dense, unnatural forest. And when you do that, you have a lot more fuel on the landscape and the fire scenario switches. It's no longer this on the ground, patchy severity, um, frequent thinning event. This is a high severity crown fire grab the dog and cat, get out of the house, run kind of event. Um, and the consequence, the, the ecological result is something like this. This is uh, the Medno Creek fire in, in sand dunes from 2010 um, that basically anything within the perimeter of that fire is gone. Nothing survived, even species that have thick bark um, and are adapted to this. So the idea is, well, let's go in and let's cut some of that fuel out. Let's reduce that fuel that's accumulated because we stopped fires. Let's cut some of that up. Maybe we haul it away or maybe like Rocky Mountain National Park does here, they stack it in these piles and they burn it when there's snow on the ground and they get rid of the fuel. So they come in and uh, they, they take a, a few steps um, of fire and they take a lot of fuel out and then they return it back to this scenario with the idea that we'll go back into this positive feedback loop if we let fires persist on the landscape. But not so fast, my friends. This is great. Five to 20 year intervals. This is wonderful. This is a wonderful ecosystem. It's basically describing this ponderosa pine forest type. All of this green here, it's maybe describing most of the ponderosa pine forest type here and maybe up to about 20% of the ponderosa pine forest type in Colorado. Um, it is not describing your forest landscape here in general though. So we know it's true for ponderosa pine, but we need to find out if maybe this other scenario is true in some places. So this is why we do fire history work. There are many places where stands are naturally dense, fires are naturally infrequent every 70 to 400 plus years. Um, and that these are high severity events. So this is a natural type of fire. This is a natural um, kind of scenario. Um, so if this is your scenario, then trying to get to that point is not ecological restoration. It's not following um, the natural patterns of this system. So the goals of fire history, what is the natural frequency, extent, and severity of fire? So we just need to get some of these basic ideas. Is it frequent, patchy, low severity? Or are we on the other end of the spectrum where we have these infrequent, high severity, extensive fires? So this scenario, frequent, patchy, low severity, or get out of the way, grab the dog and cat kind of scenarios. Was it altered by fire suppression? Either case, has fire suppression caused some unnatural um, pattern of fire or forest conditions? And if so, is there a need for restoration? So just because you've skipped a fire cycle, perhaps, it doesn't necessarily mean that your forest has changed dramatically. So we need to get a little bit more information um, to know if we need to be trying to get these fuels removed um, and, and back to some other former, formal um, natural functioning state. So how we do this, 
uh, two main methods, two ways of getting information, both tree ring based. One is we core trees um, and we want to get the age. This is a, a former field assistant, Alex Mensing. Um, he's drilling an increment bore into the base of this old ponderosa pine here and pulling out this long core sample here. And we're going to get the age and how quickly that tree was growing based on that. And the other method is uh, cutting fire scars. If a fire passes by a tree and it doesn't kill the tree, if it's low severity when it pa passes by a tree, um, oftentimes on the upslope side of that tree, it'll wrap around the tree and the hottest point of that fire is out close to the tips. And it heats up the cambium, which is the living part right underneath the bark of the tree. It heats up the cambium to a, to a lethal point and the cambium dies, the bark sloughs off, and we get this thing that's called a fire scar, or also sometimes referred to as a, as a cat phase. When future fires come in, um, the bark is actually thinner here. The bark actually insulates that cambium, tries to protect it from fire, um, but oftentimes on the upslip side, when you have that fire wrapping around and maybe you have some dust built up here, it's just too hot right here and it kills the cambium. Um, the next fire that comes along, if it's not too severe when it passes by this tree, um, the bark isn't as thick on that leading edge. The tree is actually trying to heal over that fire scar and the bark isn't as thick on that leading edge and you'll get another fire scar right there. So we can come in with a handsaw or a chainsaw um, and cut a wedge. We don't cut down the tree. Um, we cut a wedge out. We use a hammer and chisel. We pop it out. We sand it down in the lab and you can see this has a, a fire scar here, 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 and maybe something back in here, but not real clear. So it leaves these lines in the tree ring record. And we can use a, a microscope and we can say, okay, there was a fire in this year. Um, and in some cases we can even say, hey, this looks like it was a spring fire based on where it is in the, in the ring width, or it was a fall fire or it was a midsummer fire. We can't tell about winter fires because the tree is not putting on any growth there. So we've got ages and growth rates and then fire scars. In this high severity scenario, um, you can imagine if we go in today and we don't know what the fire history is and we core 10 to 12 trees like I did um, at the base trying to get the pith, then you're going to get the ages of those trees. If they all come back and they say, hey, this one established in 1851, this one in 1850, this one in 1855, this one in 1860, this one in 1858, you get the idea. We have a cohort. If they have very rapid growth, that means depending on the species and its ecology, it's probably growing in an open site. Um, and we can deduce from that that there was a high severity stand replacing fire event at that site. If, however, we core a bunch of trees and their ages range from 1600 to 1900, their, their initiation, their establishment dates, and we've got a lot of fire scars, that's indicating that we had a, some sort of Apache mixed to low severity fire um, uh, fire system and that you had kind of continuous regeneration during windows um, between fire events. So I was not allowed to cut fire scars on Hunter Smuggler, um, although I did. So I, I, I went in with the idea that I was focused on tree cores. So I went into 14 randomly located sites in diverse forest types and cored a total of 165 trees in those plots. Uh, they're about the size of this room or so. I would go in um, and core about 12 trees in an area the size of this room. But I did find three fire, scar wet, uh, fire scarred stumps on the edge of, of the uh, hunter smuggler area up towards um, Warren Lakes and uh, outside of the of the um, kind of the open space area where I was told do not cut any fire scars and I used a, a handsaw not th that's a, a, a different project I used a handsaw um, and cut three of those from these stumps um, and I brought one of those here with with me today so that's what I'm going to base my um, fire history result kind of interpretation on here we have even age cohorts no doubt about it Trees are regenerating in each of these patches I sampled. They're regenerating in a 10 to 15 year kind of window. They have rapid growth. Um, we kind of have these three different periods that are represented uh, an 1860s to early 1870s establishment period, an 1880s establishment period, and then kind of this early 1900s, about 1902 or so to 1915 establishment period. 
Um, Pre-settlement fire trees, so the settlement era in this region, the European settlement era, um, was about 1850 to 1900 or so. Um, you know all of the cutting, all of the burning that went on during that period. There are very, very few trees on Hunter Smuggler um, that predate that, that period. So we have this fire scenario, infrequent, high severity, um, stand replacing type fires. We also had mining, so the place is littered with stumps. How do we know that, uh, how do we know that these miners who were cutting trees, you know, it's hard to find a, hard to find a picture of a mine site um, that doesn't have either just cut stumps all behind it, or you see here all these gray trees. Um, it's not showing up too well here, but um, these are all burned trees. If you ever look at these photos of old mines, they are almost always cut in the background or all of the trees are burned. Um, the settlement era had a lot of, of high severity drought years. It's a big fire time. Um, miners were sometimes accidentally starting fires, sometimes intentionally starting fires. It was easier to clear trees. It was easier to cut them, et cetera, move around the landscape, um, do some prospecting via horseback if you didn't have to ride all the way up a slope, if you could just look at it um, from the valley bottom and say, oh yeah, you know, I see a, a, a uh, this layer, this geologic layer that I know is rich in silver or whatever you're interested in, um, if the trees are removed, it's a lot easier to do um, that sort of, of uh, thing. So there were a lot of reasons to burn. How do we know that this isn't just from land clearing, etc.? cetera? Um, so part of it comes from, uh, I've seen a lot of these forests um, and uh, you know, have almost 20 years of experience doing fire history and high elevation forests in Colorado. Um, and it looks a lot like some other sites um, in Colorado. The other thing that's really interesting is that there are a lot of, of charred stumps. There's evidence of fire all over the place. Um, these charred stumps indicate that they were cut before the fire occurred. Um, so fires actually don't consume and don't char trees if the tree is, al is, is alive. It usually just kind of singes them. It burns up the needles, but you don't get this from a live tree that where the fire came through, or it's very rare. Um, but these, these stumps that were cut are all over the landscape, um, but there are a lot of patches where there aren't any cut stumps that were preserved. They tend to be preserved very well if they were cut and then burned and kind of basically cured and dried out. Um, there are also, on a lot of these cut stumps, um, a lot of fire scars. So here's a fire scar from the top view, um, looking down on it. I didn't cut those within the study area, but I did ring counts in the field um, with a little hand lens trying to figure out basically the time between the initiation of this tree, the fire scar date, and then when it was cut. Um, and the return intervals are generally fairly long. Um, but this one that I cut was a, was a dead standing lodgepole pine. Pretty cool story. This is actually um, a, a pretty unique uh, uh, sample for Colorado. So I, I believe that it, that it was burned in a fire in that 1860 or so fire. Um, and then if we go back, so that would be the outermost ring here would be 1860, very well preserved, unbelievable. Um, the fire before 1860 was about 260 years before that. So we have a 260 year fire free period. Okay, that's a long time for fuels to accumulate. That is not a high frequency, low severity fire um, type. Um, the scar before that was in about the year 1540, and this tree initially um, germinated in about 1490. Um, How big around was this stump? It was about that big around. So that's about, you know, a quarter of it. Not very big. Yeah, so that was a. Uh, you know, if it hadn't burned in 1860, it'd be over a 500 year old lodgepole, which is a very rare thing for lodgepole pine um, and very rare that they have that many fire scars, to tell you the truth. Um, and uh, very rare that it wasn't rotten. And they're actually there. Th this landscape has um, a very rich fire scar record sitting on it, um, which, of course, I would love to uh, to get a hold of. So I have pretty high confidence, although if you remember some of those fire intervals I was saying back in the 1500s, we had two fire intervals that were about 50 years. That's pretty short for this 
fire scenario. The 1500s was a dry century, in particular the end of the 1500s. It was, it was quite dry. Um, we don't have a lot of trees that, that regenerated before the 1500s um, that we can find because they either burned up or um, they just died from drought. Even in the Southwest where we have a lot of long-lived trees, a lot of times tree ring-based studies, we go back into the 1600s and boy, all the trees you know, that, uh, that are older than that are just not apparent on the landscape because um, the 1500s were so hot and so dry and had so many fires um, and so much drought that killed trees. So fire suppression impacts, let's get this straight. Um, we've been suppressing fires probably effectively since about 1940, 1950, post-World War II. Um, we, we became very good at this with all of the infrastructure and knowledge and, and, uh, and um, kind of structure that we had in place to fight fires. So let's say 60, 70 years of fire suppression, um, but we've got return intervals ranging from 50 to 260 years. Um, that's not a great, a super long time period to really be altering this system. Um, so I would say we haven't really altered this system. We haven't really changed it. If you can go 260 years between fires naturally before we alter things, um, 60, 70 years of effective fire suppression has not dramatically changed this landscape. So in that context, do we need restoration? Do we need to try and get it back to this scenario? Um, is the forest more dense? Has it changed from fire suppression, et cetera, et cetera? Oops, sorry. No, we don't need to do this from, from a restoration perspective. Um, but there could be other reasons to, to do that, right? Um, but in terms of restoration, if we want to go in and do this, thin this out and burn these piles or take away the, the wood and try and create that, um, we are creating something that's not natural. We don't know what the ecological consequences are of, of creating a novel landscape. I can tell you um, Rocky Mountain National Park did this on the edge of, of the park next to the town of Grand Lake because they were afraid of fires burning into Grand Lake. Um, and I thought it was quite curious because you have high severity stand replacing fires in this system. Um, and they know they were not recreating some natural landscape, um, but they were trying to create some sort of a fire break between the park and, and the town of Grand Lake. Um, the mountain pine beetle outbreak came through here and they loved these trees where it had been thin. These trees were growing a little faster. They left the larger diameter trees none of these are, gone, are, are left. In the adjacent forests that they did not thin, that were the same age as this patch regenerated following a fire in 1851, the mortality is about 50%. So about 50% of the trees are still there. In the areas that they thinned, no trees. So we don't know. Remember, there are ecological legacies to all of these disturbances and all of our management actions. So um, we need to think long and hard. So implications for fire management. I am glad I am not a fire manager <laughs> covering hunter smuggler. I can tell you that much um, because this is not natural. It could have untold uh, ecological consequences. This is your natural fire type. If you want to restore the site, if, e if natural ecosystem processes are your big management criteria, this is what you want. And that's what your landscape's going to look like. That's the Medino Creek fire. That entire drainage basin is gone. And um, you know, we were there last summer, so four years following the fire, and there are very, very few seedlings. You can walk for a couple hours and not see a seedling. Um, so the context of these fires and regeneration in an era of longer summers, hotter summers, seedlings are very sensitive to moisture stress, they are just not coming back in this fire. Um, so here's Aspen, here's Hunter Smuggler. We've got a pretty difficult choice. I mean, I, I'm just a, a, a simple professor. I can't imagine what these houses much, must cost, probably at least $200,000 or something, <laughs> maybe $250,000. Um, and you know, it, uh, this is a real conundrum. What do you do? So this is not natural, this is natural. You've got a, a bit of a situation on your hands here. 
I think at this point in time, I don't, you know, I don't want to give any, you should do this, you as a valley or community. Um, and you know, Carbondale, the whole valley should be thinking about events like this, and you should be preparing for events like this. Um, you've kind of dodged a lot of bullets amazingly. You must be very nice people. Um, yeah, um, because you know, there are fires all around you, there are beetles all around you, and um, you've kind of gone through, skated through 14 years unscathed, mostly unscathed, um, whereas the rest of the state has just got a lot of, of things going on. I mean, we've got, we've got in the last 14 years, we've got fires on top of fires in a lot of places. Um, and you guys haven't seen a, a whole lot um, going on, and I'm not sure exactly why that is. I think part of your beetle um, uh, resistance is that your forests are a little more diverse in terms of within a stand. There's a lot more species diversity within a stand than there is in other parts of the state. The only other part of the state that come that's similar to this is the Sangre de Cristos. Um, and that, that diversity doesn't help you with a fire, but it does help you with beetles. Um, the Sangre de Cristos have, been, um, have also largely dodged the beetle bullet, but you go into a single patch this size of this room and you've got a lot of different species, about twice as many as what you have in a similar size patch up on Hunter Smuggler, which is relatively diverse. Um, so I think that's helped you out with beetles, um, but you need to be thinking about these things. And I, I don't want to tell you you should be doing this, you should cut patches, you should have prescribed fire, um, but give you some, some general guidelines if you want to make some of these decisions and you want to think about, okay, we don't want this to happen right next to Carbondale or Aspen or anywhere in the valley perhaps, I don't know. Um, what can, you, what can you think about? Well, if you're gonna go out and do some treatments, um, the consensus at this point in time among ecologists is diversify your landscape. Diversify as much as you can. Right now, you have a very homogeneous landscape, at least on Hunter and Smuggler um, area. There, all, all the trees are regenerated in the late 1800s to early 1900s. That is not very diverse. We would love to see some patches that regenerated from the 1600s all the way up to patches that regenerated in the 70s. You can't create patches from the 1600s, but you could create patches from 2015 or 2014. Last year, they actually did some treatments up here to, to break up this landscape, to try and create some diversity. Create that diversity in age and species composition. So the idea is it's just like the stock market. Um, you don't want to own all of your landscape in 140 year old trees because they are all susceptible to the drought simultaneously, a beetle simultaneously, et cetera. So you want some young regenerating stands, you want different size patches, you want as much diversity as you can get. Right now you have a very homogeneous landscape. It's a bad scenario. Um, decrease uncertainty, like I said here. There are all kinds of surprises, but we can cut down on surprises. Get as much information as you can about your landscape. So we've got some fire history here. Um, of course, I'm a researcher. I'm going to say you need more research, but you know, it, you do. You need to learn some more. Some more. Uh, you need some more information about your landscape so you don't make some um, crazy error that ends up taking your landscape down the wrong pathway. Get as much information as you can to cut down on the uncertainty. So if you say, hey, if we burn this, what's gonna come back? Let's you know, get somebody, me or somebody else, um, to try and cut down on that uncertainty. And Aspen is a, is a great example. For the most part, you burn Aspen, it comes back as Aspen, but there are certain stand types, self-replacing Aspen stands that we've just started to realize. Um, you can burn them and they were very stable and they were self-replacing. So you had aspen dying and new aspen coming up and all of a sudden you open up that site and new seeds can come in, et cetera. Um, and expect surprises. You'd better expect surprises. More scary stuff. I've been warning you about beetles. I think you should be thinking about beetles. Um, here's Western North America from 2000 or 1998 through 2012. Um, here's Colorado. All of these colors are different beetle killed forests. You know, you guys are kind of in this donut hole area in here. Um, and then here's the latest snapshot of uh, very washed out, sorry about that, of the spruce beetle outbreak, which is spreading from the south um, and from the north. And then you've got uh, quite a bit 
popping up just to your west. And this is a big deal. This is um, a very high severity event is what we're seeing. These used to not be so high severity. We just finished a project in the San Juans reconstructing using a lot of the same methods to reconstruct past spruce beetle outbreaks. Um, we used to have frequent low severity spruce beetle outbreaks that would maybe kill 15 to 20 percent of the of the spruce in a single valley. We sampled five valleys in the in the Wimanooch wilderness and found that to be the case time and time again in all these valleys um, and many many more samples and, and sampling sites than in uh, than on the hunter smuggler site. So it's a very convincing story um, and this outbreak like I said is basically you know, once it's run its course, it's basically 100% mortality. Um, so if you know the San Juans, um, there's no pine in the subalpine like we have in the rest of the state. Um, and there's very little subalpine fir actually. So it's nearly 100% of the landscape is Engelman spruce. And you can walk for six kilometers and, you know, count uh, 100 live trees in six kilometers. And a lot of these trees were five, six, seven, eight hundred years old. And uh, that landscape is, is very altered and uh, don't know where it's headed. All right, so the take homes, um, fires are large and frequent high severity. That's the bad news um, I, or that is the news and, it, and it's not good in terms of a fire management kind of scenario. Um, limited impact from fire suppression. So you don't have this mandate to restore your landscape. You know, hey, it's, it's been altered by people. You really need to restore it um, and get it back to this other thing. Um, we really don't have that, that mandate here. Um, this is an extremely challenging management situation. It's challenging to, to, to manage for these types of fires in general. I mean, even the Park Service um, has a hard time outside of large parks. Um, Yellowstone is the only park in the lower 48 where they really truly um, can let these things go and have some confidence um, that they will uh, not necessarily run out uh, uh, of the park and um, take out town. So you've got this situation next to a valley with a lot of communities. Um, not only, I would say, not only a lot of communities, but a lot of people um, whose livelihoods um, are dependent on this landscape looking nice and being intact. And um, you think about what a high severity fire in this valley would do if it was on um, Ajax ski area or snow mass or something like that. Um, it could be devastating to the ski industry. And then you start adding up things like, hey, um, the following the High Park fire in, in uh, just west of, of Fort Collins, you know, I didn't think through all these things. I think about fire and forest, but um, boy, the, you know, the fly fishing shops, a couple of them went out of business. Um, the raft guides went out and, you know, got shirts with collars or something. I don't know what they did. Um, poor raft guides. Um, you know, it has all of these trickle down scenarios. And we also have things like downstream users for water. Your runoff's going to be faster. Um, the, the stream temperatures are going to be higher. You're going to have all sorts of ramifications for ecosystem services. And in particular, in a valley where, um, you know, people are concerned about recreation and their view shed and um, all of those things. Um, this could be a, a bad situation and give disturbance ecology a, a bad name when it's actually a, a real hero for us here. Um, and, and lastly, my only advice, I'm not going to say any details of what you should do, but diversify if you can, diversify that landscape if you're going to do something. And I, you know, in general, if, if you didn't, if this site wasn't next to downtown Aspen, I'd say, leave it alone. It's going to burn. And it, there's a good chance that it's going to burn relatively soon. We see, I, I, I deal a lot with um, how ocean basins influence our, our climate. And um, we've seen this past 14 years of lots of fire. And the Atlantic is actually, has been in a phase that should be suppressing our fire. So when it flips, I, I can't promise you it's going to all burn up, but I'm scared, I'm concerned that, you know, when the Atlantic shifts into a warm phase, which it was from 1850 to 1900, when most of our state burned, um, nearly all of our lodgepole pine forests regenerated during that 1850 to 1900 period, to give you an idea, um, you know, that was during a warm phase of the, of the North Atlantic. We are in a cool phase right now. That is suppressing our drought severity for the last 15 years. Believe it or not, this has been a 15 year period of pretty frequent high severity drought. Um, 
so uh, we don't know what's, what's going to happen there, but uh, you know, get ready for this, potentially diversify your landscape if you're going to do something. Um, learn about your landscape, study it, put in plots, start gathering information um, and to decrease uncertainty. So if you do things, you don't get these surprise results like, oh wow, the beetles kill all the trees in this, in this patch. Um, and now, by the way, that patch without any live trees, um, it's more prone to spotting. So if a fire approaches it, um, the wind speeds are accelerating into that opening um, and it's more likely to pick up burning material and throw it into the city of Grand Lake. So we have all of these, um, you know, surprise kind of scenarios and expect surprises. Thanks for your time. I appreciate you coming out and just for support, um, Tony at the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute funded um, this project. And one last note, if you go up on that north side of, of uh, of, or the south side of, of Hunter Creek, these aspen patches are so cool. They're on alluvial fans and uh, they are, they look, I haven't studied them, but they look to be self-replacing aspen stands. So if you just look in that forest, it's not all large trees. You've got a huge range of, of tree sizes and probably ages there. So it's probably a stable aspen community. In theory, it shouldn't be here in 10 or 15 years given our, our projected climate. But my bet is it's going to be there for a lot longer because it's on that alluvial fan. What's that? That's on the, on the north side of Smuggler Mountain. Um, so Hunter Creek is like right in here somewhere. Um, and there are these alluvial fans, which are deposits from the streams coming down this north side. And to tell you the truth, they were probably, um, they probably benefited from mining activity. I imagine that they washed down a lot of the stuff and these big alluvial fans these aspen patches sit on those um, and they've got a nice water source down underneath them. It's probably going to let them, hopefully going to let them um, persist well into this century. Thanks. trees are dead. Somebody told me that if a fire were to start in Steamboat, basically it would burn from Steamboat to Vale. Do you think that's true? Uh, I, I think that would be highly improbable. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that, so, th so that's Lodgepole Pine Forest. Um, it was attacked by mountain pine beetle. We have a lot of plots in, in those forests um, in northern Colorado. And you know, that, the severity of that mountain pine beetle outbreak varied tremendously. There are patches where it's near 100%, um, but there are a lot of patches where you still have 40, 50, 60% of the trees surviving. Um, you have a lot of regeneration, lodgepoles coming back. We actually see a lot of subalpine fir expanding its range um, into those stands. So, um, you know, the, in terms of the, the influence of beetles on fire, um, we just finished a, a project, a research assistant in my lab at, at CSU. Um, the, the, the original idea was, well, there's a lot of fuel out there, right? There was a lot of fuel out there before. It's just changed. Now it's dead and it moved from the canopy to the forest floor. It actually probably stays wetter longer on those needles, stay wetter longer on the forest floor. A tree, the bowl of a tree doesn't dry out very quickly. Um, those are, those are the big coarse fuels. They take a couple years maybe to dry out. Um, so, so the idea is, well, you know, initially it was, well, these things, they're going to burn, right? They're going to, they're more likely to burn. And, you know, a lot of people have looked at, at individual fires and landscapes. Um, and we just, we can't, and we model it and we do all sorts of things. The models say, they should dry out a little bit earlier because you have more sunlight penetrating, you have uh, more wind getting in there and drying things out, et cetera, et cetera. They should dry out, let's say they become flammable, I don't, I don't really know, maybe three days before the live green forest does. 
Um, so it doesn't really make a big difference. We had the West Fork fire in the San Juans and that beetle killed forest. That was two years of drought, exceptional drought. I went over Wolf Creek Pass that spring. I could not believe how dry it was. There was no snow. We see over the last 500 years of, of tree ring work. So um, in my other fire history work, we go back generally to about you know, 1600 or so. All of these fires occur in severe drought years, exceptional drought years. And we've had these beetle outbreaks in the past. We just can't find any association between beetles driving cycles of, of fire. Drought drives fire. But, but, in this project that we just finished, we looked at all the U.S. Rockies, and we asked this simple question of, we use satellite images, does the beetle-killed forest burn more than what we would expect given it, it, its extent on the landscape? In other words, let's say you know, you've got uh, a, a landscape of 100 units, and 50 of those units were beetle-killed. Well, if beetles don't matter for fire, and we had 50, 50 units burned, in theory, over a 30-year period, over all of the U.S. Rockies, 25 units would have burned in non-beetle-killed forest, and 25 units would have burned in beetle-killed forest. It's not the case. The beetle-killed forest burns more. So um, I have a really bright student who um, I kept telling her, go back and look at it again. <laughs> Let's, we're trying to find a climate signal. Are these beetle-killed forests burning in, in years when it's not as hot, not as dry? What's going on? We can't, is, are they in a different climate scenario? Is it La Nina versus, you know, what in the world's going on? We cannot find a climate signal to save our lives. And last uh, fall, I spent some time um, talking with fire managers around the state and uh, in particular with fire manager at Glacier National Park, which Glacier National Park was hit hard by mountain pine beetle in the 70s, and it's had huge fire years every four years or so since 1984. Um, and the fire ecologist there, Dennis, worked there as a firefighter in the summers in the 70s in college. He knows that landscape really, really well. So I talked with Dennis, I talked with a lot of other fire managers, and basically, they don't tell me that it's burning more or anything, but they all say, when, when the fire gets in beetle killed for us, our models of fire spread are not accurate. Fire's moving faster, it's spotting more. Um, we don't have confidence in estimating flame lengths. We don't have confidence in where we can put people in to cut lines. We don't have confidence in where we can fly a plane to drop retardant. So basically, um, the, the, the story is they're doing indirect attack. Um, so they are pulling back. They're no longer going to the front line up against the fire um, and cutting lines and bulldozing and dropping retardant. Um, I had a, 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 one of the pilots who was dropping retardant on the West Fork fire in the, in the San Juan Mountains say um, that he's been doing this for a long time. He was flying over. He dropped his, his um, suppressant, and then, you know, the plane goes up very quickly because it's much lighter. And he went up, and he cruised up to very, a very high altitude. I don't know where he was. Um, and there was still burning debris coming past his plane, um, and he had never seen that before. Um, it was exceptionally dry. It was exceptionally dead. Um, so it was open. Winds moved through these forests faster. So we think based on talking with a lot of fire managers and not being able to find a climate link. I would love to find a climate link. I mean, it would, it would help my, my research publication, right? Because then I could be in science or something. Now I'm going to be in a lower level journal, journal because I won't have some exciting, sexy, hey, here is the climate link. Um, instead, I think it's this indirect influence that they just don't have confidence. And in particular, after 17 deaths in Arizona, um, you know, we tend to pull back even further naturally. But if you don't have confidence that you can put people in there, you're not going to do that. But I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about beetles causing a fire from steamboat to, uh, to, to Vail. It's not that the, I mean, I think in 1851, from Winter Park up to Wyoming basically burned in 1851. But I think that those were probably a lot of distinct different fires because you have older patches intervening here and there. 
but you should still be scared of fire. <laughs> question and one is the whole time you're talking is like I was aspect seems like a lot of um, uh, modeling and you didn't really talk about the north aspect and the east aspect and how that works in the whole forest landscape and then your second part of it was um, lessons learned and it was like okay if we're going to diversify as land managers do you end up on some of these aspects doing more activity to diversify. I mean, it seems to me like you just showed on the hunter smuggler that area with the aspens. Do you focus on that area that has the southern aspect? Yeah, um, aspect is really critical. There's no doubt. So in general, when we do these studies, north facing aspects tend to have older forests and longer um, uh, return intervals than south facing aspects. Um, in terms of a, a treatment or trying to break up the landscape, um, I think, you know, I, I have a lot of ideas about how this could be done. Um, and I think that you would not want to focus on one aspect. I think you would want to, um, you know, spread out, diversify as much as you can and, and have treatments in different areas, different forest types, different elevations, different sizes, et cetera. Um, in terms of the aspen there, I would not touch that. Um, I think that you're opening up the opportunity for, for a conversion to conifer um, forest if you were, were to touch those aspen on the north facing um, sites. Um, on the south facing sites, just across the valley, uh, I don't know. I don't, you know, that would be a really interesting question. If you know those aspen, I spent a little time walking through there trying to figure them out, and they're scraggly and, um, uh, yeah, they're, 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 they're an interesting um, forest type, but. Uh, I don't know if they're self-replacing or not. It's not obvious. We would have to take some cores, et cetera. I'll tell you, the, the, the other big thing that I would say is um, to d diversify instead of just cutting patches, the other thing you could do is you could put up some, some elk and deer exclosure. So I put in a lot of plots last summer, not fire history related all over. Um, I think about 100 or so um, uh, up on Hunter Mountain in the context of cutting down uncertainty for these treatments that the... Uh, that the county and city are doing. And they did cut, I think, three or four patches up there in the fall. So I went in ahead of time, I put in these plots within the areas that they were gonna treat and then in controls adjacent in areas they're not going to treat. And um, yeah, I spent a good eight days up there. Um, and I think you're, if you're concerned about Aspen, your biggest concern are, is not climate change right now, it's, elk and deer eating them down. They're all browsed beyond belief. Um, so you may have other areas where you have self-replacing aspen and it's just not obvious or it's not allowing, the processes aren't allowing the, to occur because elk and deer are eating these, munching these things down um, and keeping them suppressed so that you do have these seral even age kind of stands. Does that, yeah, did, that helps. did I get to both parts? No. Thanks for coming. Yeah, one, one more. Yeah. Oh, I have an observation. One theme that's been rolling through this whole presentation is this whole issue is like natural disasters. If you want to call it a disaster, there's lightning. Yeah. There's avalanches. There's beetles. There's elk and deer eating things all of which, or none of which, was caused by man, theoretically. Occasionally, there's an occasional fire because of carelessness. And my philosophy has always been, you can't, you know, don't mess with Mother Nature. And here, the answer, a lot of it is to mess with Mother Nature. Correct? Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm just saying it's kind of ironic. You know, that I... Not, that all of this is I would, natural. Yeah. Events. Well, what can we do about it? elk and deer bring back wolves. That would be really nice. You keep those elk and deer running, you keep their populations a little lower, and your aspen, I think, would, would see a change. Um, in terms of messing with it, I, the only reason I suggest messing with it, I'm a very hands-off um, kind of scientist, and that's generally my perspective, is let these things um, take place and, and let's see where it goes. Um, my 
my uh, so I, I really appreciate your question. Um, so my context for saying diversify your landscape, you know, expect surprises, et cetera, and in particular, diversify your landscape. I am assuming that this valley is going to do something at this site. They are doing things. Um, and if you're going to do something, I, as a scientist, I want to steer you towards a, a hopefully good result if we can't have a good result. Um, the real, the real issue here is not fire. It's not beetles. It's none of the, it's none of these things The the problem exists because we live there, right? Um, same thing with all these fires in the front range. Well, the high park fire, um, it probably did a lot of ecological benefit for that system. Um, but it's a hazard and it's a problem and everything because we've got people all over the place. Um, and, you know, people lose lives, people lose property. And then we're also, we have all these ecosystem services. We need water, we need clean water, we need regular water, we can't have our dam silting up, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't like landslides after these things. Um, so I, I totally agree with you. I would, I would love it if we, no, I wouldn't love it if we all lived in the front range because the traffic is already bad enough. Um, plus I would, I would rather live up in the mountains anyway. But um, if we could, you know, maybe the other way to think about this is, can we constrain where we're living? Um, in particular in the front range, if you're familiar with it, you know, people are just expanding. Our population growth is crazy. And people are expanding, in particular, as it warms up, they say, oh, I want to I live up at 9,000 feet elevation. You know, that's the problem. It's not fire that's the problem. It's the fact that we're living there. Um, but until the insurance companies crack down and say, hey, you can't be insured, um, we're not going to let you rebuild, you know, we're, people are going to live here. It's going to be a hazard. We're going to do things. So um, I think I've, I haven't given up, but... Um, I acknowledge that places like Hunter Mountain, um, the Tahoe Basin <laughs> in California, um, that these places, that they are humanized landscapes. Um, and, you know, if you wanted to do any of these treatments in the wilderness, in a wilderness area, I'd be the first person given cutting checks, big checks, 50, 60 bucks a pop to Sloan and Wilderness Workshop to, to defeat those, um, those things. But this is next to Aspen. They are going to do something. Um, can we kind of constrain that, contain it to um, closer to town, hopefully? Um, the other things, you know, I don't, other things that you could do would be try to promote Aspen. Aspen is a natural fire barrier. Um, it could be quite expensive to try and promote the species Aspen. Um, I think the town of Aspen is probably promoted by <laughs> funny. Um, so you could promote that, restrict people from building further into these wildlands. Um, you know, so, so there are a number of things that we can do, but if we're going to do something on this site, if you're going to do something, um, you know, I would say diversify would be my, yeah, I don't dis like, disagree at all with the solution. It's just, yeah, ironic, it's, yeah, no, it is it's usually humans who have, uh, hunted some species to extinct, yeah. extinct or polluting the atmosphere or something. Yep. In this case. The, that's the, other, the only other thing that makes me feel like we may, we may have our hand forced to intervene in some cases is that the rate of climate change, um, I showed that slide of all these species should be moving upslope. Um, they're not. <laughs> they're actually, they're largely moving the wrong direction. Um, and that's because of disturbance type, I think. So we just resampled all these plots in the front range that were established in 1972 and 1973, 260 some odd plots. Um, species are moving the wrong way. Um, and that is bad. Our, our landscape is going into a more precarious situation. Um, and the rates of warming that we are expecting, they need to be moving like they have never moved before. We need these things to be throwing seeds up and germinating and migrating, we need that to be happening now. We can't wait till 2030, 2040, 2050. Um, so to see that they are not moving up slope as expected um, is, is a concern because we could, we could end up in a scenario where all of our species are in places where all of a sudden they can no longer exist and we just lose vast areas of, of forest in the state, which, um, 
is, would be a natural process and everything, but I think um, given our society, our need for water, habitat for animals, um, I, I think that uh, maybe that's where we draw the line and we actually start planting species. We start saying, all right, ponderosa pine, we're growing you in a nursery and we are going to plant you at the elevation where you can exist. Um, Aspen, unfortunately, is kind of the loser in this whole game because um, it's, hard to, it's hard to do that with Aspen. Um, and the way that it naturally, we, Aspen in, in the Southern Rockies, we don't really think it regenerates via seed. Um, there's maybe one or two accounts of it in the last hundred years regenerating um, with seed. So it's generally re-sprouting. So um, it can kind of migrate, but very slowly. And if it hits a road or a Walmart parking lot or a, you know, whatever it is, we also have this fragmented landscape. Um, that's going to make things even harder for species to move. It's highly unlikely that we're ever going to learn how to prevent lightning or avalanches. You know, so yeah. it's going to be a never-ending mist of young. Oh yeah, no, it's no, and 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 for and, and that's good, right? Avalanches are good, um, and you know the Swiss, with all of their precision and knowledge and. Um, great thinking. They became very good at, at stopping avalanches. If you've ever been through Switzerland, they have all this, you know, um, yeah. fences up high that are keeping the snowpack stabilized. They ended up with a more contiguous landscape, um, and it ended up, you know, one of these other ecological surprises that it, they ended up um, facilitating spruce, their version of a spruce beetle outbreak and allowed it facilitated the migration of spruce beetles across the landscape. Um, so they have, they have learned the hard way that controlling avalanches is not a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing if your house is below the avalanche pathway, right? Um, so. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, thanks so much for coming. I appreciate it.